Good morning. It is good to see everyone here today. Thank you for coming, being a part of this morning's worship service. I want to welcome everyone who's joining in with us, whether you're joining in with us through the radio, the TV, however it is that you are able to hear or see us. Uh, it is our prayer that as you listen in that the Lord will speak to your heart and touch you in a mighty and profound way. We are so thankful uh, for the opportunity to be heard all, all around this, this, this area, this territory, this, this part of the country. We are so thankful for that, and we hope that we are making a difference in someone's lives. Thank you all for being here, and thank you all for being a part of this day. But before I go, uh, I was made aware of some interesting news just a moment ago. As is the habit of so many here who deny their birthdays, Amen. Uh, I found out that even the young people have decided to deny their birthdays. And uh, Casey just had a birthday, so we're going to sing happy birthday to Casey. Okay. He's already singing. I know it. He's ready. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. No one loved that more than Mary Layla did, I'm telling you. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Steve. We're going to get back into worship service and song this morning. And our first hymn is going to be hymn number 144. We're going to be out of the Methodist hymnal this morning. And we'll sing all verses of This Is My Father's World. Let's all stand as we sing. Let's all remain standing for our affirmation of faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father Almighty, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ, and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. 
Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn this morning, we're going to sing the first and fourth verse of hymn number 462. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Once again, 462. At this time, if our ushers will come and receive this morning's offering, followed by our debt, our building fund offering.
Pam sure has gone over and beyond the call of duty picking out the wonderful songs today. And uh, I know we got another good one before we turn it over to uh, Brother Steve this morning. Hymn number 189. We're going to sing all verses. Uh, Ferris, Lord Jesus. That was a lovely sound to hear. That was good. If you have your Bibles with you, and would like to join with me in reading this morning, I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 24 through 25. Matthew 16, verses 24 through 25. Matthew 16, 24 through 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. For whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words. I remember some time ago during one of our summer vacations in school, I sat down one afternoon to watch a, a tiny portion of the Summer Olympics. I hadn't watched it all summer long, but on this particular day, I just it kind of caught my attention. On that day, they were they were covering the gymnast the gymnastics competition. 
a fascinating thing, these, these gymnastic competitions, those young people who can do amazing things as they hurl their bodies through the, through the air, twisting and, and turning and somehow being able to land on their feet. I, I couldn't even get started, much less land on my feet. I turned on the, the TV just in time to see a, a little girl at the, at the end of what I would call a, a runway. In a moment, she took off running and she ran toward what the sawhorse kind of looking thing at the, at the end of the runway. And just before she arrived at the sawhorse looking thing, she, she held up her hands, placed them on this horse and, and threw her body into the air, head over heels and, until finally she landed. But when she landed, she immediately picked up one of her legs and remained standing there on the other leg while the, while the crowd around her went com completely wild. In a moment, I realized that her jump had secured the, the first gold medal ever won by the U.S. Uh, gymnastics team in the Olympics. I, I didn't know the whole story that day, but I, I knew that I had witnessed in that moment a, a piece of Olympic history. Later, Mark Starr wrote in the New Newsweek magazine, it was an athletic event inscribed for the ages. It had been a closely fought match all afternoon with the Americans holding a slim lead. All they needed to, to win was a, a solid performance on, on the vault. I, I think that's the sawhorse looking thing that they call it. The first four had gone safely. The fifth person had missed both of her opportunities. And it came down to a young lady by the name of of Carrie Strug. Carrie Strug was the, was the last to go. The first time she not only missed her ball, but when she landed, she felt her, her ankle snap. I don't think they knew how bad it was, she remarked as her teammates hollered at her to shrug it off. You can do it, Carrie. Carrie cried out she was in pain, and was it necessary for her to go on and, and do that second vault? Her coach, Bella Caroli, uncertain what was going on, shouted encouragement to her. You got to go. You, you kept on pushing her. Carrie Strang, Strug said she, she felt the gold medal was slipping away from the U.S. Olympic team. Strug said she remembered whispering a prayer. God, please help me out somehow. The next thing she knew, she ran down that runway of sorts with a broken ankle and she vaulted into Olympic history forever to be remembered for her effort. I enjoy stories like Carrie Strug's. I love watching people overcome adversity to do great things. It is a thrill for me when just at the time things looked like it couldn't get much worse, that it wasn't going to work out. Something wonderful and something unbelievable happens and and you get to be a witness to it all. I particularly enjoy those occasions when people overcome the adversities that are, are far more difficult, you might say, than a broken ankle. I enjoy stories like the story of Corey Ten Boom, who overcame the cruelty of Nazi Germany, who overcame what many would have considered justifiable hatred to be an advocate for God. People like a David Ring, a gentleman with cerebral palsy, told he could never amount to, to anything, never to expect a normal life or marriage or children or any of the things that everybody else had. But today, he is a dynamic speaker on behalf of Christ throughout the church. I've had the good fortune of hearing him. And oh, by the way, he has a family. In last county, he had four children. So sometimes extraordinary things can happen. But still, no one believed in him at first. These people and, and many others like them are our heroes, aren't they? We, we love to admire them and adore them. We love to, to love them. Of course, their stories are a lot like Jesus' story, too. All the authority of the Roman imperial government came against him. The hatred of the Sanhedrin was hurled at him. Nails were driven in his feet and his hands, a sword pierced his side. He died, he was, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. But just when his foes, just when everyone thought that they were certain that they had stopped this carpenter claiming to be a Messiah, 
just as they began to believe that they had put this to rest forever, when they thought they had triumphed over a trumped-up kingdom of, of God about love and compassion, just when they were feeling quite justified that they had ended this false prophet's life, what does God do? The stone is rolled away from in front of the tomb. And Christ is let loose on the world as a man, a king, a messiah, a God who can never and will never be defeated. Jesus' story is a story that encourages those of us who love him to go on when, when life is cruel and our adversaries are numerous. It is a story that encourages us to strive for victory with, with God by trusting in God. It is a story that reminds us that, that love is stronger than hate, that life is stronger than death, that right is stronger than wrong, that good will always one day overcome evil. Jesus said, if anyone wants to become my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. To follow Jesus is to be like Jesus as best we can. It is an opportunity to, to champion God's cause in the world. No one has ever said that being a follower of Christ, that being a Christian is always going to be an easy road to travel. If they've ever told you that, you probably uh, should listen to someone else. Sometimes there are challenges. Christianity and what it asks us to do oftentimes demands a lot of each of us. Jesus never made any bones about that. Men have always struggled with being what Jesus asked them to be. Look at the, look at the story of, of Christ's ministry. People were close to him, in love with him, as long as he was healing the sick, raising the dead, and feeding the hungry. Great crowds, we are told, were, were following him over and over again. But what happened when he said to them, you need to be able to turn the other cheek. You need to love your enemies. Sell all that you have and, and give it to the poor. Judge not lest you be judged. Give to your brother not only your shirt but your coat as well. What happened when he spoke to the Samaritans, when he healed or helped a, a Gentile or two? What happened when he spoke brutally of the wickedness of the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees for their hypocrisy and their legalism? I can tell you what happened to Jesus. Those big crowds of supporters became 11 men and a handful of women on that last day. Following Jesus was not and is not for the faint of heart. Not everyone who heard him speak was willing to pay the price necessary to be a follower, to be a disciple of, of Christ. The following Jesus was not for the faint of heart, the skeptical, the judgmental, the greedy, the prejudicial, or the hate mongers. To follow Jesus was to be strong enough to fly in the face of humanity and the humanity of others to, to be like him. To follow Jesus was to never be afraid of, of laying aside our priorities in life in order to immerse ourselves in his priorities. But you see, Jesus knew this would be required of those who followed him if the good news of the kingdom of God were to, were to spread throughout the world among other people with their customs and their own prejudices. Yes, yes sir, to be a, a Christian is to be called to rise up. To rise up and be strong in the face of adversity. To go against sometimes even the human grain. To be a Christian is to become a, a champion for God and the cause of God in our world. Of course, the call to follow Jesus is also a call of self-denial. Jesus said, if anyone would be my disciple, let him deny himself. Do you know what it means to deny yourself? If you've ever known the heart of a parent, as I know many of you have, then you, you know a little bit possibly about self-denial. Glenn Paulson in his book, Turning Point, tells about an event that occurred during his senior year in college in the midst of the Great Depression. His family did not have the money for his first quarter's tuition, though the tuition for a quarter at Northeast Missouri State would, would only be about $20, books and all, everything included. His dad didn't have the $20, but he told Glenn not to worry. They would go to the bank, and they would sign a note together, and they would get the $20 so that he could go to, go to school. The next morning, the, the banker was sorry to inform the family that he could no longer loan money without 
collateral, so he didn't have the opportunity there. Undaunted, they, they visited some other individuals in the community, too, who, who was known to, to loan money for such things. Unfortunately, by that time, all of them had to have collateral as well. It seemed there would be no way for Glenn to, to finish his college education, to, to earn his degree, until one day a big truck pulled up to the front porch of their house. Glenn wasn't home when it happened, but he heard about it later. There was one thing his mother loved more than anything else except Jesus and her family, and that was her Golderson piano that she owned. In fact, it was the only good piece of furniture in their home, he said. Glenn Paulson wrote that his mother cried as she watched her piano carried away, but the $35 she got for it got him through school. Glenn recalled later how that's love like God's love. The most precious possession he had was his son, and, and yet he gave him up to, to us. He gave him up to be disgraced and crucified so that we could learn to love the way that God has taught us to love. When Jesus said that those who follow him must deny themselves, the truth is he was asking no more than he was willing to give to those who would follow him. How often do God's people, or how often should they be reminded of this? Many things will come up in the life of the church. Many things will come up in your walk with Christ. Many times you are going to be confronted with needs, times to deny yourself in order to serve God, the, the church, and the, and the cause of Christ. And each of us, all of us, will have to decide, can we do it? Will we do it? Are we even willing to do it? Being a Christian isn't always easy. Sometimes, sometimes we will need to make sacrifices for the cause of Christ. It's the call to follow Christ. is the call to be strong. The call to follow Christ is the call to self-denial. The call to follow Christ is also a call to do just that. To follow. Christ's disciples looked toward Christ for leadership, for guidance and wisdom, for strength and encouragement, and for the truth. Sometimes we need to remember who is, who is to lead us. Sometimes we in the church forget the power of prayer. We forget to put our trust in God and God's vision for the world and, and our community. Sometimes it's as though we are leading rather than being led or surrendering to be led. Surrendering to be led by God's Holy Spirit, the intentions of God's, the word and the example of Christ's life. Jesus said, follow me. And so we follow wherever and whatever he wants us to do or to go. We do it because we do it on faith. We do it because we believe in him. We do it because of all that he's already done for us. We do it because it makes a difference in this world. Sometimes we will have to rise above difficult circumstances and uncertain times to be strong for Christ. Times when we just aren't sure if we can get this done anymore. If the world hasn't changed so much that we just can't get it done anymore. We'll have to put our, our faith in something other than ourselves. We'll have to learn over and over again to trust God and that God knows just what he's doing and, and what he wants done. But this I believe. This I believe with all of my heart, to all of us. If we are keeping our eyes and our minds and our hearts on Christ, if we will trust him to lead us, then we will have done our best part, the part we should have done. Carrie Strug said she prayed. She prayed, God would, God help me somehow, she said. That is a, a good prayer for us too here at Old Bethel United Methodist Church. God, help us. God, help us to serve you. God, help us to serve you like a champion. I close. The altar is open to anyone who'd like to come for any needs you have. I invite you to come at this time. Our closing hymn is hymn number 530. Let's all stand. We're going to sing the first and fourth verse.